so my name is Maya Grasso, and I'm from one of the squishier fields, like Peter has noted. And I definitely agree with him. I mean, if we had uh, expanded kind of the range of social, psycho social and behavioral sciences to include a lot more questions, I think we would have ended up with a much richer understanding of human condition during the pandemic. Um, so from the start, actual behavioral and social sciences were actually quite involved uh, with the pandemic response and almost universally uh, forwarded role was to support, support the pandemic response. That message was adopted pretty quickly from the outset of the pandemic and all the efforts went into the question of how can we actually uh, reduce transmission? How can we support the existing public health recommendations and kind of get this under control? So a lot of effort has gone into that. So. The key role really focused on compliance. Now I say key because the social and behavioral sciences were really um, quite diverse. There was a massive range in the types of questions asked and not all of them had, any, uh, had uh, much to do with compliance. But the key questions really came down to, well, how can we get people to comply, wear masks, get vaccinated, remain social, stay socially distant? And what influences that? And what kind of, what stops that? So there were so, I mean, so many studies uh, that uh, resulted from it, as you can see. Um, concern was one of the things that tends to promote uh, compliance. Conspiracy beliefs tend to reduce it. So what I would like to do is really kind of position this as a consequence of good intentions. So there's consequences to these pro-social motives that we had to support the pandemic response. And there were good intentions. So we wanted to promote the concerns, but could have we inadvertently created some fear instead of it? We wanted to combat misinformation. Did we do this selectively? This has been kind of the theme for, to, for today, but I will add some data, some different type of data to it too. We promoted the benefits of compliance, but could we have created taboos around it? Because our intentions were very pro-social and we needed to protect our goal of making the world a better place through increasing compliance. And numerous other things like promote trust in science. Did we promote trust in pseudoscience? We wanted to combat right-wing ideologies, news that spread nonsense and so on. But did we kind of let all of the other nonsense go by too? So, I'll view this as kind of a good intentions that has gone astray. Why? Okay, so um, the theory is that COVID was an invisible threat, an invisible threat that required coordinated action. In social sciences, coordinated action to solve these really complex social problems is the holy grail. It, it uh, deals with people working in unison. To have people working in unison, we absolutely have to have a shared reality. We have to agree on basic, most fundamental facts. We have to use those facts to create shared beliefs, shared values. And only then can we all, all of us, strangers from different parts of the earth, do join together into solution of a single problem. Now, some problems, some threats, do this very quickly, okay? If we see fire on a hill, we're not going to sit here and ask each other, what is it? Should we pour water in it? No, let's put, pour some gasoline on it, right? It's not going to create those divisions based on political ideology, based on our religion, based on our national background. It's so obvious that we really do not need to do anything about it. But what made me interested in COVID, um, although I'm not, a, I'm not a health scientist, is that this is an invisible threat. Same as you know, climate change as well, which is the, changing temperatures at the top, same as attributions and allegations of, for instance, systemic issues like systemic sexism and so on. These are, these are more challenging issue issues that create divisions because to some people, the problem is so completely obvious. It's right there, it's obvious. Why can't you just see it? To other people, it's not at all obvious. And when things are not obvious, when we cannot see them, we cannot test them, we have to turn to something else. We have to turn to expert. We look for some beliefs. We, join, we, we engage in some sense-making um, that requires something else. So in the context of COVID, we disagreed on the most fundamental basic facts, which, which means if we have one plus one, one plus, sorry, two is three, okay? Is it one plus one? 
No, we did not count COVID the same way. When we talk about hospitalizations, we talk about spread and so on. We use such different metrics and such different circumstances that made math, basic counting, basic fundamental aspect of collective action and stable societies impossible because we used entirely different criteria of how we communicate fear. Same for yes or no. This works usually means uh, affirmative. This doesn't work means negative. So words, do we use, do we put the same definitional boundaries around these words, yes, no, good, bad, and so on? So we look at something like this. This is the Bangladesh science study. Assuming, you know, this is all great. We can look at something like this. And again, because of the lack of obvious, that's like fire-like uh, signal of danger, we can see and say, well, this this means it works. This means that this treatment actually works. Masking works. To another person, it doesn't work. It means it doesn't work. To somebody else, well, it might work, but is it worth doing? Is it worth um, mandating? Is it worth shaming people for? We don't really know. So we disagreed on these basic facts. The threat of COVID was not so obviously proportional, but again, we still needed to do something. We needed co to create a collective um, coordinated action. So we looked at, as people, as we looked at the numerous origins of disagreement in quantifying harms. And because COVID was messy, I mean, ranging from cases long COVID of how we, how we do it, creating a shared reality required also deciding when to end information. Coordinated action usually requires some simplification because it needs to be obvious. If it's not obvious, it needs to be made obvious to a sufficient number of people for them to engage in such a coordinated action. So these types of, th uh, these types of data were compatible with coordinated action. And that's how we tell stories. That's how we told stories about COVID, what happened. We focus on cases, cases, cases in a hospital. This is from New Zealand, by the way, just recently. Uh, we, we focus on those things that inspire collective action. This is also from social, psycho, uh, social, science, social and behavioral sciences as well. We use the same type of uh, information to inspire collective action. We focus on cases, we focus on deaths, how many people died and so on. Of course, where, and where information ends is kind of arbitrary, but we do need to create something, right? We need to inspire that. So this is from uh, UK's um, Behavioral Science and Disease Prevention. One of the point was, uh, points was create worry, but not fear. And many countries like Australia right here had similar, very graphic imagery of people gasping for breath, trying to get them to um, engage in that coordinated action. So there were some consequences and some consequences to our perceived reality. And I think that they are really understudied from a uh, from, um, perspective of academy and perspective of social and behavioral sciences. So for instance, if we look at this graph, this is estimated COVID-19 hospitalization for unvaccinated, uh, dated in August 2021 in Gallup panel. Okay, so what is the correct number of people? What is the correct percentage of people who end up hospitalized for COVID? It's very low, right? But the public sentiment tells a very different story. I mean, 50%, uh, you can see how many, 40, yeah, sorry, by, it's by political ideology, which I'll say, some, uh, say a bit later. But quite a few people at the very end believe that the unvaccinated at the time had 50% chance of being hospitalized if they get COVID. That is a really such a significant risk overestimation that we do not have any shared, re a shared reality. Same case from, uh, same graph is uh, done by Brookings. There's actually quite a few of these that document the extent to which our shared realities were completely non-existent. So what is the estimates of COVID um, hospitalization by party? At the time, Brookings Institute, this is Brookings, uh, put the numbers down to about five, one to five percent, and of course, it's very age stratified. So this is the correct answer. Now, almost a third, around a third of adults believe that the rate was 50 percent. So if I end up in a hospital, I will, uh, if I get COVID, I will have 50 percent chance of um, being hospitalized. 
Now, in my field, social and behavioral sciences, all the efforts, all the efforts, almost exclusively went into these people. I use this figure quite, uh, just uh, for that purpose, as an illustration. But people who underestimate, who people who maybe don't believe uh, the threat is real, who negate the threat and so on. So we went nuclear on addressing these misinformation efforts of this, this type of a group. In my own data, I have found um, similar patterns. But people who really believe that uh, COVID was planned by some global powers and so on is really, really small, right? But we went nuclear to combat them like crazy. Now, you can see, yeah, fake news about COVID, fake news about COVID. It's almost exclusively from that perspective. People who undervalued the threat, that was the focus. Now, people who kind of got it right were also often view, uh, clumped in as COVID minimizers. But then these people, which is a pretty sizable chunk of U.S. population, and I would say probably in other places as well, were almost exclusively ignored. I mean, if I'm an individual, um, a regular citizen, and if I believe that if I get COVID, I have 50% chance of being hospitalized, that's going to have consequences as well. And that's something that really has, has been completely outside of um, any mainstream social psychology uh, outlets. I have um, two articles, one my colleague Kevin, but of course that has consequence. If we overestimate risk to such massive degrees, that also has consequences for social fabric. We might be more licensed to shame people, we might be more likely to scapegoat others because we're terrified. I mean, that's how scapegoating arises. We're so terrified that we make, we, we license ourselves to, um, shame other people, hate them, because we think that we're right and we're so deeply afraid. So in con context of COVID, we did not have that shared reality. But we also needed some shared beliefs, which goes quite hand in hand with that, right? So some, a couple of people here talked about the importance of kind of uh, importance of uh, trust in science and where it went. And again, this too has a bit of a dark side because we really focused on trust in science. We really promoted it. Okay? And we not only promoted it, but we devalued doing your own research. And um, there were quite a few efforts that went, went into describing why that's a bad thing. Okay, so trust in science, trust in science during COVID receives so much attention. Again, this got cut off. Again, this has some consequences. What trust in science, like any blind trust does, it can also make people quite susceptible to nonsense and pseudoscience as well. This is from one of the publications. It does not have to do with COVID, but it's an excellent one. So we did a study in one of our, in one of our uh, projects where we, told that to people. I mean, when we, when we wanted to understand the consequences, right? So these, these claims were not backed by any scientific evidence. They were not backed by any, any evidence at any point in time. Elimination is the best global strategy. Young kids are at high risk, okay? But if people believe, sorry, if people believe those claims, that has consequences in which I'll show. And another point of the beliefs, if we, want, if we demand that people believe scientists so much, we might essentially sanctify them. So in our study, we ask people to endorse the extent to which they agree with statements like this. Scientists are the only ones who have moral authority to dictate, to, to, to guide appropriate response, right? We're removed from any kind of uh, truth generation. We're now talking about moral authority. And indeed, if people believe in science as a kind of a moral authority, and if they believe in evidence that is unsupported, it does tend to, again, ruin the social fabric by people not trusting others. So this was done in um, mistrust and unmasked people after uh, mandates and endorse pandemic mitigation authoritarianism as well. Okay, so we have the beliefs. And another one, the last bit that I will talk about, is this issue, sorry, of moralization of COVID. Yeah. So when we moralize an act, we link, what it, uh, we link goodness with it. We, we link what it means to be a good person. We need it to moralize it because otherwise, because it's a fuzzy threat, nothing would have happened. Uh, people would have not engaged in that coordinated action that we really wanted. 
But this is something that does evolve quite naturally. It's not something that needs to be imposed. So you can see this is from PNAS uh, the, uh, proceedings um, of how we talked about uh, compliance. So for instance, uh, this is about symbolism and wearing a mask. Um, this is a health is a form of a public good, and everyone's health and behavior improves odds of everyone else. So masks are really the symbols of altruism and solidarity. So we're again beyond the facts, right? We're in a moral territory. We are we are going into moralization. Okay, so it's a social practice. It's not just about that. Okay. So moralization is an interesting one because it kind of places taboos around quite a few things. We place a, a taboos around ideas and harm. So as the theme, theme has been here, just asking questions, just innocent asking questions, it challenges people's beliefs and destabilizes coordinated action. You cannot have coordinated action if people poke at you. That's quite annoying, actually. So asking questions tends to be linked with things like danger, unsafety, irresponsible. Like uh, Peter has said before, it's not really, you're not going to be challenged on pure academic grounds. Your moral character should be combated. So of course, this has been um, covered by a few people today, so I won't go into that. But here's the thing. What if these people who are contrarians all along, what if they're just bad scientists? I mean, just because people are full professors, have lots of publications, doesn't mean that they're really that great of a scientist. There's a lot of things that go in it. And maybe they're one of them. Maybe they're really not worth listening to because um, relying on consensus is functional. So this is something that we wanted to understand, right? We have things like this. Um, I pulled this out from various random sources. The study has severe flaws, it's inconclusive, and so on, right? No study is perfect. Every study is going to have flaws. But when it comes to COVID and evidence generation and creating that shared reality, what, how do we know? Who are we even listening to? Maybe those contrarians are just bad and we really shouldn't listen to them. So we did a study. Um, we wanted to understand whether people would accept, how people would perceive identical research proposals, okay? So we wanted to see whether presenting people with these proposals will um, be perceived differently depending on what's the cause. So we introduced ourselves as, uh, when we introduced, introduced our study as, there's a lot more to it. We wanted to either understand human suffering that results from abandoning elimination in New Zealand at the time. I lived in New Zealand during uh, COVID. Or continuing to pursue it. Right? Of course, when we introduced ourselves as these people, right, to continue to pursue elimination, so that was kind of challenging it, um, the study was rated as of less quality. It was seen as relying on less quality information, worse methodology, worse reputation, less trust. And the way that we did the study is we said for every completed response, we will donate $1 into a charity of your choice. And we asked people in the end, do you believe we'll make, do you think we will make this donation? And they actually trusted us less when we were these people in the red. We made the donation, there was no, no question about that, but they just trusted us less overall. Although the quality, everything was held identical, it was an identical thing, right? So are the identical research proposals seen the same? No, no, they were not. So the questioning, the very trying to build that shared reality and trying to come up with understanding of the situation was impossible because taboos were placed around it. And we could not really ask these questions because questions is um, destabilizing for collective action. And let me just give you one more last example. I have in one minute that I have left. Um, with comes to moralization and shared reality, it also influences um, how we perceive harm. So as uh, Vinay has already shown this slide, it's a really famous one. There was plenty of bullying going around, right? Plenty of, plenty of nastiness going around in regards to COVID. Are, is all bullying seen the same? Do we see a harm to another human the same way, depending on where they come from? You see now where I'm going with it? The answer is no here. So I'll go, get to it. But it, we wanted to hold it constant, right? The tweet is constant. It's the same stuff. Usually this type of behavior would be viewed as incivility and it's generally frowned upon. We don't like that. 
but it's a little more um, it's a little more acceptable if the person is being bullied for uh, one cause as opposed to another. We actually had similar type of uh, responses here, but I'm out of time, so I'll, almost. Am I out of time? Oh, wow, okay, then I'll finish with this. I'm still fast. So, um, yeah, what I wanted to show is um, the way that we impact, that we, the way that we generate the shared reality is also um, destabilized by the process of moralization. So again, I was in New Zealand, and you can see how we, how we view, how we view uh, misinformation or errors. This type of, uh, this uh, study, was fully wrong. I mean, the, it was advertised as study finds nearly a quarter of infected children needed hospitalization. That was very wrong. It was actually uh, dealing with the fact that people who checked into the hospital, a quarter of them required hospitalization. But the correction was very slow. It was just a, a, a matter of an oops rather than something that is actionable as well. Okay. And I'll, the last thing that I just want to mention I didn't plan on it, but political ideology has really permeated absolutely everything regarding COVID. And I myself have observed that uh, those effects to be so insanely strong. And from my field, social scientists, uh, social sciences perspective, we have kind of ignored it. We have mostly focused on malignancies of conservatives. And there was plenty of material there, of course, too. But we have nearly completely ignored how um, the liberal side in America, which then is exported to the rest of the world, to our great enjo enjoyment, have largely omitted these very glaring flaws, like for instance, fueling vaccine hesitancy. I mean, this is definition of vaccine hesitancy. I don't know what it is, right? But it is in the mainstream outlets. But we don't, this, these types of behaviors are pretty much absent. So good intentions gone away. And I will just end on two notes. We have reasons for pessimism. Uh, I know I was asked to say a few more positive words. Uh, sorry. But these, uh, I, was, I really tried. And I'll say why. But uh, we really, these types of divisions, as long as we have these uh, invisible harms, these divisions will simply go on. Uh, I wish I can be more pessimistic about that. And the last one, number five, we really don't know when to stop looking for problems. I really encourage you to look at the study by Levari, who, who demonstrates this so elegantly. Basically, as problems become solved, we don't adjust our perception. We see more of them. We just relabel things that are solved as problems. So we are kind of stuck, I'm sorry. But I do have a couple of uh, bits for going forward that apparently should maybe give us a little more, hop uh, more uh, optimism uh, in life. And they base, yeah, they are based on just exchange of ideas, which has been a theme here. Um, Thank you so much, and uh, I will let another speaker. Thank you.